Okay, now over here, we'll talk about these, uh... Okay, now, these, these are the Russian artists I was talking about. 19th, 19th century. Uh, most of them lived in the 19th century. Some crossed over into the 20th. Uh, some even uh, lived up past the uh, Bolshevik Revolution. But, uh... You know, as I said, they were influenced by so much of the, uh, you know, intellectual talk and uh, the talk of revolution. Remember, it was Karl Marx in Germany and uh, Tolstoy in uh, Russia, Zola in France, and they, you know, were, and there was a lot of talk about doing art that had to do more with the people you know, and justice in the face of the aristocracy and the power elite, you know, and there was a lot of talk among artists, and many artists did paint like this, although many of them also had to make a living, so a lot of their art, you know, was also portraits and other things. But over here, uh, you can see here where it's, this looks almost like a Norman Rockwell, you know, in the sense that here you have this master and he's got this kid crying, it's called a novice. So it's a little bit like an illustration, you know, because it kind of brings out that sentimental touch of his poor kid. Now, this is interesting, this one here, because you have this feeling of depth, you know, space, which is something that we try to do. Now here, for example, you have a bunch of gypsies, and, uh, you know, this is something that normally, you know, people would not necessarily paint. Uh, I think about it because, for example, uh, you may have seen paintings I do of beggars or homeless, and this is a little bit like that, you know, uh, except it's another time, so you may be thinking of it differently. Who's going to want to hang up something of a homeless person in their house? So you have to think about that. But these people, I think, came across with the idea that there's something in real life, you know, that is more important. And that money is important, but it's not everything. And I think that was a fact. Okay, here is another um, painter. This is not somebody I really know. Kazat, Kazat, Kazat. But I've seen this painting around, and uh, I think it's very well done. If you think of Richard Schmidt, for example, uh, the composition in here has a similarity. Uh, he's dealing with a group of people, but against the background. Of course, the people here are more significant in that they're the main focus. Uh, and also, there's, you know, that social implication. It isn't just, you know, a little figure choreographed nicely, but they have a meeting, and they're toiling, you know, and this is part of life. Okay, now, this guy, this guy I think, is one of the greatest. I don't have such good examples in this book, but Krumskoy, he was a fabulous painter, and he was one of the early painters in this group in the early 19th century. Uh, and he did some wonderful paintings. But over here you can see the way he painted this uh, person who looks like a peasant, but I don't know, just as a title of his name. How does his name start with a K or a C? K. Krumskoy. 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 
Okay. Now, he was an artist. This is that painter I started telling you about. He was a Jewish artist. Now, many of these painters were a little more enlightened. You know, they, you might say they were more liberal progressives of that time period. Now, during that time period, the Jews were disliked in Russia. And not only by peasants. Sorry, she was right here. Oh, okay. Not only by you know peasants, but of course by the the power elite. You know, but there was a lot of anti-Semitism. So Levitan, like most Jews, were not allowed to enter into Moscow, and they were not allowed to go into various places. But these artists were much more enlightened, and they accepted his company as a fellow artist, you know, which was a very progressive thing in that time. And these are some of the landscapes that he painted. He lived along the Volga. Uh, a number of years ago, I took a trip to Russia, and I was going down the Volga. I got off the boat, and we're going to visit this town called Nizhny Novgorod. And there was a little boy who was selling a book of Levitan's work. And he said, $10 in English. So I thought, hey, that's a good buy. So I bought it. About an hour or two later, there was another kid. He also said, Levitan book. And then he said, $8. So I thought, well, I'm getting a bargain. So then I went into the town, and there was a bookstore where the clerks didn't care if they sold anything or not. And there were stacks of the same book for a dollar and a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> so They got you well. Yeah. And, and you know, capitalism has just come back. I visited, it must have been 1993. And capitalism had just come back, and these kids learn fast. You know, and they learn not only the money, but how to speak it and how to say it in English. So anyhow, that's <laughs> a little story. And then we visited his house, which is like a museum thing now. Okay. But this feeling of space is uh, very beautiful in these things. Okay. And this is the one I spoke about before, an artist named Perov. And this is the painting he did of Dostoevsky. Okay. okay, now here is a painting by Repin. Okay, and when I saw these Volga boatmen, I thought of Pat. Especially when I painted him for the first time, you know, with the beard and the whole thing. And uh, if you saw a close-up of these, you see the characterizations of these people. Some are young boys, some are old men, you know, treated almost like chattel cattle, you know, pulling this boat. And uh, that's why it's called, in general, called the boat, and here it is too. But there may be other names for it too. Now this is a painting that I was very much influenced by. When I did a painting called Peace March, I looked at this, although this is a much better composition. When you come to my studio, you'll see that painting. That painting I did using a for, uh, camera. And I photographed on people on a Peace March going down Broadway in 2006. It was against the Iraq war. And uh, but I saw the way people were composed here and walking, so I got some of the same ideas. But in this, the way he's grouped people is just amazing. This is a masterpiece painting. Uh, but in addition to the artistic characteristics, <coughs> uh, you really see his insight into forces of society. You see the police, you know, on the horse in their smug uniform, the uniforms on the horse. Uh, some are beating peasants. Here's a, uh, probably somebody working for the police, beating this kid on crutches to go forward. Uh, these guys are carrying these religious trophies. You know, and over here you can see these uh, esteemed members of society, you know, like, you know, rich people walking along, very smug you know, in their attitude towards these, you know, serfs who are walking around them. Now, this is an expression of perceptiveness, I think, or one of the ways you perceive people in society. 
They play certain roles, and their personalities and characters are formed that way. When you come to my studio, I'll talk a little more about the role of the individual, you know, as part of a mass of people, you know, and how I perceive it, and how I did it in my recent painting. But this this painting, I think, is one of his uh, Reppin's best. Okay, now over here, again, you see this painting of a, of a peasant. Uh, and I think it's powerful. You know, the, the human feeling, you know, is the bottom line. I mean, you can talk about art elements. That's a part of it. Very important part. Without the art elements, it's not a work of art. But if you have the human factor and you have your art elements around, you can get that expression across. So it really communicates. And art is, for me anyhow, communication of ideas. Okay, now here's one he did, it was sort of joking. Now, this is interesting because here he's painting at a time when you have, you know, these various uh, aristocratic groups around. And over here he's, uh, He's got, this is called, uh, let's see now, a uh, mocking letter to the Turkish Sultan. So these guys are writing a letter and they're joking, you know, making fun of the Sultan, as some uh, hierarchical figure, uh, I guess, in their environment. And they kind of look the way they are. They look a little bit like Cossacks or, uh, you know, from the southern part of Russia in the various provinces you know, and that you may have heard of in the news. And in fact, I think a number of them now, you know, are probably Muslim. And you think, you know, who this kid who was caught with the bomb in Boston, I think, you know, they were a part of that, in that group. I think it was Georgia. No, right? Chechnya. Oh, Chechnya. You heard of Chechnya, right? But these, these are Cossacks. Cossacks. That's from the Caucasus. Uh, no. <laughs> it's okay. from All right, it's another section, another section. Okay. But her, 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 these are her relatives. All right, but I just want to point out, I just want to point out to you a few things, you know, artistically, or that I would observe as not only an artist, but an illustrator. There is something about the characterization of these guys that I think is very illustration-like. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes that can be good. Sometimes that can be a little bit uh, contrived for Hollywood. You know, a little overdone. And I think that's the case in some ways. And somehow, the other thing is that I gotta see art as a work of art, that it's a cohesive design. And there is something about some of these that bother me a little bit. But it's a lot of fun to look at, to look at the expressions and the way he got it. And really did. <coughs> also look at the choreography. This guy's leaning back. This guy's leaning back with his fist on the other guy's back. You know, like he's pounding him. You know, because that's part of the joking, laughing uh, process. Isn't, Max, isn't there a painting by Caravaggio where there's also a lot of writing? There might be. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk much, about that in a minute. How, you know, much, how much would the artist have models to, to set that no, up? No, they use models. Yeah. So that whole thing was set up with multiple models at one time? No, uh, you probably some at one time. A couple of times. Mostly individual at one time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the thing about Caravaggio, I, I, you know, I saw a Caravaggio show, and there were some interesting paintings there, and also, you know, torturing Christ. And there was one painting that was fantastic. I mean, did I mention it to you? A painting by Hantors. He was a follower of Caravaggio. And he had these Roman soldiers laughing as they were torturing Christ. You know, and, we, and, and they were in a Flemish bar, cavern. Very, very interesting painting. I thought it was the best painting in the show, better than the Caravaggio's. Not so much the content, but the connection with his contemporary life. 
See, I see these things as a part of the person's personal experience, what they see in their life, not as an illustration of a faraway land. You know, I'm not an Orientalist, although I do appreciate a lot of the Orientalist paintings. Okay, this is another one by uh, Rep. Hill, let's, let's move on. Okay, now here is one. Ah, this is that Jewish painter, Le Levitan. But this is a painting of Levitan by somebody called Serov. He was also a very famous Russian painter. And this is what, you know, Levitan looked like, that the Jewish artist who painted those uh, landscapes on the Volga. Guy whose book I bought from these kids who were crooks. <laughs> okay, now here is a great Russian painter who painted, you know, the the um, uh, landscapes, beautiful. Uh, Shishkin. He was one of the greatest, and he was amazing. And uh, there was a show once I saw at the Guggenheim, and I remember seeing a painting on the cover of a book about him. So I kept thinking of his work as that painting. And when I went to see the show, I was so disappointed because the reproduction was so much richer than the painting. It's unusual. Usually it's the other way around. Probably not clean. And I was dull. And at any rate, he was, he was a wonderful thing. I want to get on to this. Uh, and then there's this one here. This is by a guy named Baroshin. Now, I think this is just an amazing painting. Can you see it all? You know, I mean, to be able to paint it like that in the red lights, the distorted figure, the drama of it, you know, it was just so powerful. Oh, Yaroshenko. Oh, no, I put that Yaroshenko. I read it wrong, my own writing. You're right, Yaroshenko, this is the artist, and that's the painting that he did. Okay, he lived from 1846 to 1898. Okay, now I want to get into some of the other things here. I just don't look at the bottom. Okay. Okay, now, this is one of my favorite my French 19th century paintings, L'Ermite. Uh, now here he's painted a group of peasants. They look, you know, choreographed. But you know, a lot of these guys did use photographs as well as painting from life. But they painted primarily from life. But I like this. It's a little, you know, it's rather dramatized. But I think it's so beautifully painted. But one of the things I like about it is it gives this homage or importance to the real people. And that is wonderful. There's a human factor there. Okay, now this is a glass studio that this artist Mounier built. A number of them believe they wanted to be natural, do naturalistic paintings. So they wanted to have the natural light. So even if they were outdoors, they wanted to be able to use that light, you know. So some of them built these glass studios, you know, to be able to have that. And let me just go through a few more before we get to work. Okay, now here is a painting by Lepage. Have you seen that uh, Joan of Arc in the Metropolitan Museum yeah. where she's standing with a hand out? Right. That's a beautiful painting. That's Lepage. Much better than this one. That's Lepage. Anyhow, is it? Lionel Lepage and the Joan of Arc. But that is a beautiful painting. But anyhow, this is another one. But you can see again the way he's getting involved in the real people. All right, now th this guy, I think, is, one is wonderful. Here, uh, he's painting real French people in their habitat, you know? And the thing is that he has them posing, but he also resorted to a lot of photographs, but he painted them from life, and his painting is just exquisite. 
We don't hear much about these guys because we had the domination of the 20th century modern establishment. Who was the painter? What? Who is the painter? Uh, yeah. This is uh, Dagnan Bouveret. Oh. Bouveret. Yeah. I quote him a lot because I think he's just a marvelous painter. It's the beginning right there, the bottom? Yep. That's the beginning sketch? Uh, what does it say? It says, yeah, it says wash, pencil and wash. But the thing on the cover is really a detail of that painting. Uh -huh. I mean, and even the way he's handled the background, you know, it's really masterful. I just wonder. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are some others, and you can see some of the photographs that some of them took. Uh, one of the artists in here is Eakins. All of you have heard of Thomas Eakins. Sure. There's a uh, photograph in here that he also used, you know, to help him. And 19th century art does look more naturalistic than previous century art. Okay, the bell rang, and we're here to paint, not to look at other people's paintings. <laughs> okay.